Hello and uh, welcome to another edition of uh, the debate. Iran and China have signed a 25-year partnership pact aimed at strengthening their economic, political and trade ties. While both countries remain under U.S. sanctions, this may well be considered a real challenge to the Biden administration, which has not changed its course as far as these two countries are concerned. In this edition of the debate, we will shed light on the different aspects of this pact and discuss how it can potentially change the economic and political equations. But first off, let's watch a report. It's not the first time China's foreign minister, Wang Yi, has visited Tehran. But this time, there's a historic difference. On Saturday, Wang Yi and his Iranian counterpart, Mohammad Javad Zarif, signed the much-anticipated 25-year comprehensive strategic partnership agreement. The Sino-Iranian deal was announced in a joint statement during a visit by the Chinese president to Tehran in 2016. The cooperation roadmap consists of 20 articles covering Tehran-Beijing ties in a range of economic, political and security areas. There are reports that the pact would see Iran supply China with oil for 25 years. In return, China would invest in Iran's ports as well as banking and telecom sectors, which amount to some $400 billion. The deal has sparked mixed reactions by observers, with some saying the deal is one-sided toward China. The deal is yet to be finalized and the detail will gradually be publicized in the future. But what's clear uh, is that uh, China needs Iran's oil. Uh, in fact, China has always been a major buyer of uh, Iran's crude oil with or without uh, the deal. So Tehran should be careful what it gains uh, in the new agreement. Others say the agreement is a geopolitical one against the common opponent, the United States which is engaged in an economic war with both China and Iran. The aims of the U.S. maximum pressure campaign is to isolate Iran and uh, improving relations and having a strategic relations with uh, countries that can resist the United States pressures, countries like China, is going to be essential for Iran's foreign policy. Sanctioning Iran is going to be much more difficult. Iran is dependent on U.S. dollar when uh, Iran's uh, trade with uh, the other side is going to uh, use yuan or other uh, currencies. That's going to be uh, useful for, for Iran's trade. China is Iran's number one trade partner, but this economic partnership has been restricted by the U.S. banking sanctions against Iran. In 2020, bilateral trade between the two states was less than $20 billion. Both sides agree that the new pact will pave the way for broader partnership, not only in economy, but in politics and security. It's crystal clear that Iran and China are strategic partners. China continues to buy Iran's oil amid the peak of the U.S. sanctions against Iran. But the new pact is a milestone. Observers say at a time when the U.S. is using its currency as a punishing tool, more countries are expected to jump on the wagon and create a united front as a counterforce to the U.S. economic pressures. Yusuf Jalali Prost TV, Tehran. Well, to continue this discussion, we are joined by historian and journalist and author Marcus Papadopoulos out of London and senior analyst and foreign policy in focus Ian Williams out of New York. Thank you very much to both of you gentlemen. Uh, let's begin with uh, Mr. Marcus Papadopoulos. In what ways, uh, Mr. Papadopoulos, uh, do you believe that the alliance between Tehran and Beijing can be a challenge to the Biden administration? Let's not forget that the new U.S. administration is trying to rally its allies against China and uh, an effort to that the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, has described as the greatest geopolitical test. So do you think that this deal will affect these U.S. plans? Well, today is a momentous one for Iran and China, and it certainly constitutes a direct challenge to American aggression on Iran because Iranian-Chinese relations, which span some 2,000 years, have been taken to a arguably unprecedented height because of today's agreement. The agreement spans a whole array of uh, areas. For example, uh, Beijing and Tehran cooperating on matters relating to defense. But it is certainly the case that the uh, foremost matter which has been agreed on by the Iranians and the Chinese is trade and investment. 
China is going to invest over 25 years some $400 billion in Iran. And in return, Iran will get ensure a constant, uninterrupted flow of oil to China. Now, for the Chinese, that is extremely important because China does not have a large amount of natural resources, for example, oil and gas, and also water. Therefore, in order for the Chinese to sustain the Chinese economic miracle, the Chinese economy has to be in constant receipt of oil. And that is why this agreement is so important. Now, for Iran, the fact that uh, China will be investing something like $400 billion in Iranian infrastructure is highly important because there are many sectors in Iran which the Iranian government wishes to modernize, for example, hospitals and clinics. But at present, Western companies such as British companies are prohibited from modernizing the infrastructure because of American sanctions. And the fact that Iran will be able now to export uh, oil to Iran to, to China means that the severity of American sanctions on uh, Iran will become less severe because uh, Iran now has a very large, a very substantial market for its oil. And I would say as well that whilst I understand that there are some people in Iran who are, let's say, lukewarm about today's monumentous, uh, monumental agreement, at the same time, I would say this, that yes, it does give uh, China considerable influence over, for example, Iranian natural resources. But the Chinese economic miracle is uh, going to be present in global affairs for the foreseeable future, whether you like that or not. Therefore, Iran has to pursue a close economic relationship with China in order to accrue serious economic benefits. Because Iran's uh, economic relationships with, for example, Britain, France and Germany, though they are significant, they are not enough to lessen the severity of the impact of American sanctions on Iran. So all in all, I believe that Iran, the Iranian-Chinese uh, agreement, is one to be applauded. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Williams, uh, this uh, comprehensive pact comes while Iran has been facing political and economic pressures from various U.S. administrations. The U.S. aim uh, long, along these years was to isolate Iran. How do you think this agreement can unravel Washington's anti-Iran policies? Mm. Well, it's, it's almost, it's, it's difficult because all the parties concerned have previously backed themselves into a corner. I mean, you don't make strategic alliances. It's not necessarily friendship. It's an alliance of convenience. The convenience for the Chinese is they're getting oil, according to Iranian reports from people who disagree with the agreement, at a significant, what Iran is getting is equally significant. It's getting away past the dollar blockade put on by the United States. What the United States is getting is a smack in the face because they're losing a huge potential market to China yet again, and when they've already done so frequently. Um, and it also loses them leverage uh, in terms of the resuming the JCPOA, uh, which the Iranians, in principle, quite rightly, want to do unconditionally. And the remnants of the Israel lobby and the Biden administration want to force concession, extra concessions from Iran. So, you know, everybody gains something. A lot of people lose something from this. The Chinese win, hands down. So, uh, Mr. One of the issues, but one of the political issues for Iran, it's got to uh, reconcile with its standing in the world, is uh, the news broadcast just before this mentioned the Chinese treatment of the Uyghurs. And, you know, of course, Iran is not unique in this. Most of the Islamic countries have kept quiet in the face of America, of Chinese pressure. 
about what the PRC is doing in uh, in, in, in to the Uyghurs. Uh, and there's also the question of Myanmar, which is burning at the moment, where there's naked repression, which is being fairly overtly supported by China. So it, it, it's a trade-off for Iran. And as long as Iran makes it plain that this is a deal that they have to do because of the US, and this doesn't mean that they love everything that Beijing does, then they should be able to get away with it. So it's uh, it's it's overall it's probably a win, but they're still being forced to sell their assets more cheaply than they should because of the American blockade. I see. Thank you, Mr. Williams. So, do you believe that this could probably uh, persuade the Americans to uh, go back to the JCPOA? I don't think this is needed itself, but it's part of the incremental pressure. I mean. Look, many of us for many years on your program and others have been, uh, first of all, started off predicting and then scratching our heads and wondering when were the other countries of the world going to get together and bypass the US dollar, whether it was going to be the euro, certainly not the ruble or the Chinese RMB, you know, the different currencies. What could we do to get past the American stranglehold on, on the world currency markets, on world finance, in fact? Uh, so, yes, this is yet a further stage in the erosion of dollar hegemony, and everything that does that is probably to the good in the end, uh, and uh, I, I welcome it on that way. But I also have to say that I've got the year, uh, I've got 10, 15 years of frustrated optimism uh, behind me. I've been predicting this. Yes, I'm very it. sorry, but Mr. I'm, Williams. I'm, uh, I asked about the JCPOA, the nuclear deal, and I said, would that persuade the U.S. to go back to the nuclear deal? Oh, I was thinking of overall, but um, yes, I think um, I think I think that's what I said. Yes, I said it will be an incremental reason for the people who want the JCPOA deal in in Washington to push further against the diehards who are anti-Iranian and pro-Israeli to the max. Um, so yes. Uh, I think that the, the loss of Iranian markets to China, the fact that obviously the pressure isn't working, if the Chinese are giving a backdoor entry to the Iranians, um, it, it should help persuade the, the those people in Washington. And there are quite a lot who sincerely hope that the JCPOA is, is revived and also the pressure from the Europeans because they're losing out. Uh, they see markets going to the Chinese that they would rather like to have as well. Thank you very much. Mr. Papadopoulos, uh, this deal seems to send a clear message to the world that the countries do not necessarily need the U.S. to achieve their goals and objectives with respect to their national interests. Uh, could it be the start of a new alliances being formed with the U.S. without the U.S. being part? Well, I think it's certainly the case that uh, Iran can flourish in the world by having very close relationships, strategic partnerships, be them formal or informal, with countries such as Russia and China. But I still believe that the grave, menacing threat from America to Iran will continue no matter what the Iranian government does on the international scene, no matter how close relations between Tehran and Beijing uh, or Tehran and Moscow become, the Americans are absolutely intent on destroying the Iranian revolution, rolling back the, uh, the very many great achievements of the Iranian revolution and returning Iran to how it was during the days of the Shah, a client state. And I do not believe that the landmark agreement today between Beijing and Tehran uh, will uh, compel the Biden uh, administration to return America to the JCPOA. I believe there is virtually no chance uh, of that happening because the Iranians have made it very clear that in order for America to return to the JCPOA, America or the Biden administration must rescind the sanctions placed on Iran during the Trump era. And Biden has said that will not happen. That is non-negotiable. So America is not going to uh, return to the JCPOA. 
possible. So, Mr. Papadopoulos, you believe even the uh, economic situation and the fact that, as uh, our other guest just mentioned, uh, China is taking over a great market in Iran was not, was not enough to persuade the Americans? No, absolutely not. What the Americans want in Iran is to see a compliant government, a compliant government to Western demands, Israeli demands and Saudi demands in Tehran. The fact that China is going to uh, be able to increase <clears throat> its leverage in Iran and also uh, in the Middle East, of course, will not be to the liking of Washington. But ultimately, the Americans believe they can contain uh, Iranian influence in the Middle East and Chinese influence in the Middle East. And I should say this as well. I believe that it is incorrect that uh, it is incorrect for analysts to believe that because of the today's agreement, China is going to rapidly increase its modest influence in the Middle East. Why do I say that? Because there is a tacit agreement between Russia and China in which Russia recognizes uh, Chinese predominance in Northeast Asia event, while at the same time, China recognizes uh, Russia's leading role in, for example, the Middle East and Ukraine. So China, whilst it has influence in the Middle East, though it has to be said, modest influence, is not going to increase its influence in the Middle East because of the agreement, because of today's agreement with China, because, because China does not wish to disrupt its relationship, its magnificent relationship with Russia. I see. Thank I you see. very much. So, Mr. Williams, China is pushing ahead to establish itself as a major global and political economic power. The U.S., on the other hand, seems to be sticking to a unipolar worldview. Has the time come from, for the U.S. to realize that the world is a different place now? It's time has not just come, it's been long overdue. Uh, also from the Middle East, the writing has been on the wall in the palace of the king for a long, long time. Um, they have definitely been, they're definitely approaching the, the end game. Uh, the more astute of them realize that. And that's why I think it's wrong to see the U.S. as a homogenous interest on this. There are lots of different interests in Washington competing. And whatever principles they wave around, they will sell people out if necessary. Uh, you know, they, they've, they've dropped people before. Uh, you might remember the, the key one, in fact, was with China, where they had diehard allies in Chiang Kai-shek, where they had a huge lobby in Washington. But as soon as enough people, along with um, uh, along with Nixon and Kissinger, sat down there and did the math, they said, no. Thank you very We're much. We're going to recognize the People's Republic of China. No, it was because it was expedient, and that's the way they'll treat this as well. With Iran, if they wanted to pick up Iran, uh, and, and even with the pressure of the lobby, drop other allies in the Middle East, they'll do it. They're already beginning to. Thank you very much, Mr. Williams. Mr. Papadopoulos, we're running out of time, but I would definitely like to uh, have your view on this question as well. Do you believe that the U.S. will realize that the world is a different place now? Absolutely not. And I would cite two factors in accounting for that. Uh, firstly, American exceptionalism. And secondly, and most importantly of all, American mastery of the international stage, though it has weakened in recent years because Russia has resurrected its superpower status, remains nonetheless formidable. And American dominance of the international uh, stage is not seriously going to be challenged by China. There is talk of a multipolar world. I believe that what we are in the process of seeing is a return to what we saw during the days of the Cold War, namely two global superpowers. Russia is a global superpower. America is the overall dominant global superpower. China is not a global superpower. China is a regional 
superpower. I do not believe that India or Brazil have what it takes to become even a regional superpower, let alone a global superpower. So I believe that what we are seeing today is uh, comparable to what we saw during the Cold War, two superpowers. And in that case, I believe that we should be grateful because gone are the days of the 1990s when America had was the only superpower in the world and they were able to ride roughshod over the United Nations Charter, over international law, as they did in Bosnia, as they did in Croatia, and as they did in Kosovo. Today, because Russia is a superpower, the Americans do not have the, um, this, the, the abilities they had uh, in the 1990s to do as they pleased in the world. Thank you very much, Jim. Mr. Marcus Papadopoulos, historian, journalist, and author, joining us from London, and also senior analyst uh, from the Foreign Policy and Focus, Ian Williams, out in New York, New York. Thank you very much to both of you, gentlemen, and thanks to all of our viewers for following this edition of the debate.